So welcome everybody. I'm so delighted to see everyone here. And for those of you who are on live stream, uh, welcome to you as well. Uh, so my name is Michelle Hamilton. I teach in the public history program at the University of Western Ontario. Uh, and every year we do a community engaged project with a partner. And the purpose is to do a historical project which has a life outside the classroom. So in, in 2021, the Vision Soho Alliance, uh, which is a, a group of six affordable housing uh, groups, came together to form, uh, they came together to form the Vision Soho Alliance. And in 2021, they asked me uh, if we could research the history of the Soho neighborhood, including the role of Victoria Hospital, which of course is now uh, largely demolished. Uh, and I thought, this is a wonderful project. Yes, we're going to do this. Uh, and so for the last two years, my uh, undergrad and graduate students have been doing that, researching the uh, Soho neighborhood and the role of the hospital. Uh, that has included oral histories uh, with people in the community as well. Uh, we issued a report last year at this time, uh, which was our first year research report. We will be doing a second uh, research report uh, to be printed and, and sent out uh, and also online later this summer. Uh, and then in the fall, we're actually going to start turning all that research into uh, outdoor historical signs, which will be mounted uh, around the Alliance's property. Uh, and and, and uh, we're really excited to be in year two uh, of three of that. So, uh, but before we begin, I want to acknowledge that before uh, this was the city of London, there were many different Indigenous peoples who lived in this area over long periods of time. Uh, these groups include the Chonatan, the Wendat, Anishinaabe, Odawa, Potawatomi, and the Haudenosaunee. Before it was renamed the Thames uh, by the British, uh, the river was called uh, the Antler River, and it was used, of course, to fish and travel uh, across the land. So some, uh, there were villages also of thousands of individuals who lived here, and they used the land uh, for farming, uh, corn, and other vegetables. Uh, so I'd like to acknowledge their long presence. As well, outside of Lenin, we have three uh, uh, communities today. Uh, we have the Chippewas of First Nation, uh, the uh, Oneida of the Thames First Nation, and the Muncie, Delaware uh, Nation as well. Uh, and they have been here uh, longer um, than uh, the city of London was here. So, and today, uh, there are 11 different Indigenous groups living in the city. Uh, and so I just want to acknowledge, uh, as we're talking about a project that literally uh, builds properties on the land that we recognize uh, that long history. So I will turn it over now to Julie Ryan, who is the Community Engagement Coordinator for Indwell, which is one of the Alliance groups. And she's going to talk about the Alliance uh, project, uh, and then we will get to the history um, of the site. So, Julie? Uh, thanks so much, Michelle, and I uh, just want to start by thanking um, the students for a whole year of, of research that they've uh, put into this project. It's pretty exciting um, to, to have uh, these students and, and their leader, Michelle, working um, to, to discover um, new stories about the Soho neighborhood and the hospitals. Um, so you're in for a real treat tonight. Uh, last year was fabulous, and I'm sure tonight will be too. Um, so. Vision Soho Alliance, uh, we came together, we're six uh, nonprofit housing developers that have all developed affordable housing communities in London. And uh, so we're gonna uh, uh, take this, this five acres of land that, uh, that we've purchased from the city and create mixed income and mixed use housing. Um, and really focus on social inclusion, neighborhood integration, accessibility, uh, environmental sustainability, sustainability and of course um, affordability. So there are the six uh, partners you see on the screen there, Chelsea Green Home Society, Homes Unlimited, Indwell, uh, London Affordable Housing Foundation, uh, Residents of Affordable Housing, and Zarin Development. And we were all brought together a couple of years ago by the London Community Foundation that really wanted to um, 
uh, see this land developed for, for good use and, and kind of use their, their uh, network to, to pull us all together and to create this uh, Vision Soho Alliance. And they continue to provide um, uh, advice and uh, support in other ways as well as financial support. So we're gonna build over, um, we're gonna create over 680 units of housing and 50% of those will be affordable and it'll be a range of affordability. Indwells are deeply affordable, about $580 for a one bedroom apartment um, to uh, 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 average market rent, 80% of average market rent, which would be around $1,000. Um, and, and the other half will be uh, average market rent um, apartments and uh, it'll be a whole range, uh, studio units, one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom, um, <clears throat> so certainly welcoming um, people from all walks of life. So this is the, um, the space uh, that we're building on. So it's really bounded by um, uh, Waterloo and Colburn, South Street um, and Hill Street, and then a little piece of land on the other side of Colburn. Um, so that whole block, and if you've been by there, uh, there's only two remaining buildings on that block, the War Memorial Children's Hospital and the Health Services Building. Those two buildings will be um, uh, built by, or, or redeveloped by Indwell. Um, and then the, so the, the two buildings on the um, left and right lower are the two existing buildings. The other five buildings that you see on the screen there will be developed by um, the other partners, the five that I mentioned. Each one will build a different um, building. And beneath the four um, buildings on the main block, there'll be underground parking, and uh, uh, residents uh, uh, affordable housing um, on the other side of Colburn will also have underground parking. So the idea is let's get the cars out of, the, out of view and, uh, and really make this for people um, and, uh, and pedestrians. So this is what um, the uh, health services building uh, looks like now. It's been boarded up for a number of years. It's a huge building. We're gonna build, um, Indwell's gonna put 96 uh, deeply affordable apartments in that building. Um, and so this is what we uh, envision it to look like uh, when we're done. And this is the uh, War Memorial Children's Hospital. And we're gonna put 42 units in uh, that building. Um, so that's what it'll look like there. And there'll be a nice city park in front and around the perimeter will be wonderful signs um, researched by um, these students and the students from last year. Um, so this is one of the rooms. Uh, this is the old uh, auditorium. Uh, and, uh, and so on the lower left is what it looks like now. Um, and uh, the upper right is, is what it looked like in, its, uh, in all its glory. So um, we're working hard to bring this uh, project to fruition. Um, there's some information out, uh, out there if you want to learn more about uh, supporting the project. And uh, really um, thank, uh, thank Michelle and, uh, and the students again for this uh, great opportunity to bring this to you. Thank you, Julie. So we'll begin uh, the historical uh, research then that we have uh, been working on for two years. Uh, so as I said earlier, there's been a long presence um, of indigenous people here. Um, the ones we know today are, as I said, the Chippewa of the Thames, the Muncie Delaware Nation, uh, and the Oneida Nation uh, of the Thames, uh, who all live uh, southwest uh, of London. Uh, in 1796, uh, British officials and a number of different Indigenous groups signed uh, what is called uh, Treaty 6 or the London Township Treaty. Uh, you can see here on the screen uh, the uh, sort of uh, how it uh, partly follows the Thames River and then also has a, a large um, square there uh, on the river. This is the part that uh, the uh, neighborhood now known as Soho uh, fits into. There are other treaties that uh, do relate to the city of London, but this is the one uh, that directly uh, covers uh, the Soho area. So uh, surveyors, uh, after they decided uh, that London, originally L Lieutenant Governor John Graves Simcoe decided that London uh, was to be the new capital uh, of Canada, uh, which of course never happened. Uh, but in doing so, uh, they began to uh, plan how to lay out the streets. Um, and of course, they're in a grid street. Anybody uh, who drives the city of London knows most things are in grids. 
Uh, this is the uh, approximate boundaries of what used to be called St. David's Ward. Um, so all of the wards in the City of London had names to begin with. Um, Soho is a very recent name for the area. Uh, so you can see here the grid-like nature, except of course the Thames River, which um, curves its way uh, through sort of two boundaries. Uh, what's in the red oval there is where the uh, block that the Alliance um, has uh, purchased, um, where, where, the, where that is now. Um, but if we look at these streets, we really uh, see that their names really reflect the idea that this was to be uh, a British city uh, and, and uh, early on the capital. Uh, the names of the streets like Bathurst, Horton, Clarence, Hill, Wellington, Richmond, Maitland, Adelaide, William Gray Colburn, uh, pretty much all of them, are named after British colonial officials or members of the royal family. Uh, Waterloo, the street name reminds Londoners of the triumph of the British over Napoleon in 1815. Simcoe Street is named, of course, after uh, John Gray Simcoe, uh, and so on. Um, and so this grid really begins the erasure of indigenous presence uh, on the land. Indigenous people, of course, continued to migrate back and forth to London as it grew, uh, sometimes for work, sometimes for family reasons, for marriage, uh, for schooling. Uh, and so one of the things we found uh, in looking for who actually was living in Soho uh, is this family here. This is from the uh, 1911 census, and um, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's hard to read. If you can imagine my students uh, trolling through the, the census and other documents, um, trying to read this handwriting. Uh, but here we see that there is a family here, uh, John and Lucy Schuyler. Uh, they were from Oneida of the Thames. They're living here at 221 Clarence, which is now an empty lot, unfortunately. Uh, but they're living here with their children. Uh, and then there's a long list of young uh, single Oneida men boarding with them. It says lodger uh, in one column. Um, and so what we realized then is that th the um, communities were using their own strategies to come to London. Um, so they would um, obviously know of, of family members or others living in the city, and then they would uh, come and live with them uh, to find work. Um, so you see these groups um, of indigenous people living in Soho, um, uh, you know, trying to work together to, to make lives here. And this is actually something you see uh, in uh, immigration history as well, uh, that people from one town uh, over in Europe will join family members or friends or colleagues or business partners uh, in, in a city uh, where they know they, they have some community. Um, so it's no different for indigenous people. Uh, Roy Schuyler here, who is the uh, very greeny pitcher uh, at the bottom, he was one of the sons of the Schuyler family. They had four, four sons who went to the First World War, uh, and Roy was one of them, and here he is uh, in the London Free Press uh, wearing his uniform. Today, of course, we have the Nameran Friendship Center. Uh, it was founded in 1965, although uh, it, was, it did not... Um, it, it originated in Soho, but the, this building, of course, was not inhabited by Namorand uh, until about the 1990s. Uh, so one of, uh, one of the things we want to do in the science is to profile individuals who have uh, uh, lived their lives in Soho. And, and one of these uh, is a uh, fascinating woman named Dorothy Day. And uh, we talked to her daughter, uh, Donna Phillips. Uh, so Dorothy, Dorothy Day had a home on Simcoe Street, uh, and uh, Donna, her, her daughter, told us the story of coming home from school and knowing that there would probably be a lot of people in her living room uh, when she got there. So it, it might be community members or it might be people um, who needed to come to the hospital, but either before or after uh, would come in and visit. Uh, and eventually, uh, it became obvious that the Indigenous people needed a place to gather that was bigger than, than their living room. Uh, and so Dorothy Day and a number of other uh, Indigenous people got together um, to form the idea of, of, the, of a friendship centre. So um, this uh, friendship centre is one of the original six friendship centres in Ontario, uh, as I said, founded in 1965. Um, and um, uh, last year, 
uh, there was an opening of these murals you can see along uh, the building. So this building sits at the corner of Horton and Colburn. It was a former Jewish synagogue actually, and then became uh, owned by the Catholic Church, and then it was purchased by Namorand. So these murals were painted by uh, an artist, Michael Sywink, uh, with help uh, and inspiration from a uh, women's uh, residential school survivors group um, who, uh, you know, helped him paint, but also uh, told him stories to help inspire him of what he wanted to paint. Now, each of these murals has its own title and story, which I can't go into today because that would uh, take a long time. But uh, I do want to say that o o overall, uh, the title of this artwork is We Are Still Here. And, and that is something uh, that Indigenous people uh, in London uh, would like other Londoners to know, is that they've always been here and they still are here. Um, uh, and they're still contributing uh, in many ways to, to Soho. So I will now uh, turn over the presentation to Jessica Hugh, uh, and she's going to talk about life in Soho. All right, so a recurring theme in the history of Soho is its industrial history, sustained by the neighborhood's proximity to both the Thames River and railways. In the early 1850s, the city began the construction of the Great Western, the Grand Trunk, and the London and Port Stanley Railways, all of which would run through Soho. They made the land more desirable to manufacturers as they allowed for both um, the easy transportation of goods to and from factories. As such, many residents of Soho worked in the various factories and manufacturers that defined the area. Faced with discrimination and prejudice, immigrants often had to start their own businesses. One example include the Brenner Cigar Factory. Created by the German Jewish Brenner Brothers, the cigar factory employed many Jewish immigrants living in Soho. Now, while the majority of, so of workers in Soho were men, it was not uncommon for both women and children to be employed as well. However, only specific businesses employed women. Most were companies that did sewing or hands-on work, such as tailors, dressmakers, bookbinders, and cobblers. Some of the earliest factories in Soho include larger companies such as the McClary Manufacturing Company, whose shift change whistle could be heard through all across the neighborhood, smaller companies such as, the Will as William Dyson's um, personally owned tin and coppersmith shop that produced only cheese vats, um, textile manufacturers such as Holeproof Hosiery as well as London Hosiery Mills, and others such as Canada Bread, the London Soap Company, and Labatt Brewing Company founded by John Labatt in 1847, which would go on to become the largest brewer in all of Canada. The Forest City proved to be an ideal location for Labatt to launch his beer empire, as he took advantage of the surrounding wilderness and for building materials, firewood, and the help of local farms for malting barley, as well as the Great Western Railway to ship their products to Canada's bigger cities. While Labatt was first and foremost a beer company, to the people of Soho it was so much more. They not only employed a great deal of Soho residents, but created communities outside of the workplace, which allowed people to connect on a personal level. Commitment to the well-being of their employees as children, Labatt sponsored opportunities for leisure and fun, educational advancements, and professional development. One such program in particular, Smile Across Canada, was an exchange program where Labatt would sponsor children of employees to go live with a host family in another province for the summer. Not only did Labatt take interest in the well-being of their employees and their families, but they took it upon themselves to care for the community as a whole. During the flood of 1948, Labatt employees were offered extra work to help with sandbagging, pumping, and rescue operations. Shortly after the flood, the Labatt Mobile Disaster Services was created to help with future accidents and natural catastrophes such as fires and floods. While radically decreased in recent years, manufacturing never fully left Soho. And while many of the buildings have been demolished, Labatt remains at its original location. As the home of many diverse communities, both general, and, both general education and language schools existed in Soho, such as Waterloo South Primary School, otherwise known as the Old Ward School, Simcoe Street School, St. John's French Immersion, French Immersion Catholic School, the Talman Torah School, the Hebrew Day School, and Aberdeen Public School. 
Field trips are an element of school that students often remember with fondness, and alumni of Aberdeen are no different. One of the most memorable trips were the annual picnics at Springbank Park. Edna Nichols was a student at Aberdeen from 1905 to 1911 and remembers the picnics as a popular affair. There were only about 35,000 people in London when I went to school, she remembers, so it was possible to get all the school children together in one place. This field trip would become a long-standing tradition, and Ruth Irene White, a student at Aberdeen in the 1920s, remembers the events such as races and prizes that made her time at Aberdeen so much more memorable. What makes Soho Public Schools so special is how they broke down barriers between different groups. Soho both is and has been home to black, Chinese, Irish, Italian, Jewish, Lebanese, Syrian, Palestinian, Maltese, and Polish families in London. Schools often shared facilities, and these communal spaces created friendships among children, and other, among children of various cultural, ethnic, and religious backgrounds which characterize the diverse neighborhood we've come to know and appreciate. I would now like to welcome Nigel Klemencic Pulyasevich, who will be diving deeper into the lives of Soho's diverse immigrant communities. So I'd like to discuss a little bit about the role of religion in Soho. Specifically, I've been researching three churches in the community, St. Mary's Roman Catholic Church on Hill Street, Christ Anglican Church on Wellington, and Our Lady of Chestakova, also on Hill Street. I'm gonna focus mostly here on St. Mary's because I'm limited on time, and also its history has largely been forgotten about since it was rebuilt outside of Soho, and it sheds light on the early Irish community. The church was originally located on Hill Street in Soho and was founded in 1874 as a church for the poor famine Irish who settled in the area and were kept in immigration sheds in the 1840s. It's important to note that Irish immigrants were common in London prior to this point, and St. Peter's downtown had a congregation of pre-famine Irish immigrants that were more well-established and more well-off than the newer ones. After the original St. Mary's burned to the ground in 1901, the congregation stuck together despite the damage, and many more services were held at the church until the replacement could be constructed. New St. Mary's was rebuilt on the corner of Lyle and York Street, just north of Soho, in, sto in stone, to make it um, comparable to St. Peter's in terms of its glory. It grew to be more of an all-encompassing congregation, consisting of members of the Irish, Italian, Maltese, Lebanese, and Syrian communities. The diversity of religious institutions in Soho was primarily due to the continuing flow of immigration. Over the course of several decades, Soho experienced numerous waves of migration into the neighborhood, leading to a diverse and vibrant community. Starting in the 1830s and spanning until 1980, Soho became a haven for various migrant groups, most prominently the black, German, Italian, Irish, Jewish, and Polish communities. Further waves of immigration brought with them unique cultural practices, languages, and traditions that contributed to the neighbors' cultural richness and diversity. As a bit of a case study, I want to tell you about the Italian community in Soho. And in respect to them, I want to tell you specifically about Bondi's Pizza, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with and have fond memories about. Bondi started as an at-home pizza delivery service by Vincent Bondi's mother, who owned a bakery in Sicily prior to immigrating to Canada. This business started when she began selling pizzas from the family home on the intersection of Horton and Waterloo Streets. The first pizzas the Bondis sold were made without cheese, and their very first customer requested that the next pizza be made um, with cheese. After this, the business was booming and expanded into a restaurant below the Bondis' parents' apartment. Starting a, a business from home and then expanding into um, a further location was very common in Soho, like with Jewish scrap businesses in the community. Bondi's became a hub for community, music, and politicians alike. Things weren't always easy for the Italian community, though. In June of 1940, Canada declared war on Italy in response to the rise of fascism. The federal government passed the War Measures Act, which declared over 31,000 Italians in Canada to be enemy aliens. This heightened anti-foreign sentiments, and many Italians lost their jobs, had their shops vandalized, and faced persecution. There were two Italians interred as enemy aliens from London. Ralph Antonucci, pictured here, was one of them, and I find his story particularly interesting. He almost immigrated to Canada aboard the Titanic, but thankfully was denied passage. 
Upon arriving in London that year, he began working as a tailor at Guy Lombardo's ta father's shop, located where City Hall now stands. After getting established and marrying his wife, Antoinette Barata, Antonucci opened a laundry and tailoring business in London and also in Timmins. In 1940, during the Second World War, Antonucci was arrested and interred at Camp Petawawa, along with over 400 other Italian Canadians. His arrest was likely due to a failure to pay a chattel mortgage on appliances needed for his business, and he was released two days before Christmas that same year. Antonucci's wife operated the business in his absence, and after the war, many Italians struggled to rebuild their lives due to this discrimination. Next, I'd like to turn our focus to Maltese immigration here in London. As a part of the Maltese community myself, this holds a particularly special place in my heart. The Maltese community was largely excluded from immigration to Canada um, as of 1923, and until an agreement was reached in 1948, whereby 500 Maltese would be able to live in Canada as construction workers. From then on, migrants from the tiny central Mediterranean island of Malta began moving to London and Canada more broadly, mostly in waves between 1948 and the 1980s. The first group to southwestern Ontario in 1948 consisted of 134 mostly single men. Many of these early migrants became quickly established in London and grew to be connections for other prospective Maltese immigrants back home. As with any tiny island, most people are related somehow, and this proved very handy for getting sponsorships. A sort of informal boarding house that hosted some of London's most influential and early Maltese immigrants who came in the 1950s was at 263 Adelaide Street in Soho, hosted by Giuseppe and Giuseppina Ferrugia, both pictured here. The Pavia family was one such family that had connections to the house at 263 Adelaide. Once getting established, Lee Pavia, pictured here holding his daughter, moved his family into a house at 538 Phillips Street in Soho. They were neighbors with Paul Lewis, a black activist, shoeshine, shoeshine man, and singer, as well as the Moxley family, another black family of whom the Pavias were very close to. The mother even babysat for the, babysat for the Pavia family, and their daughters grew to become very close friends as they attended Aberdeen school together. The Maltese love of music was kept alive by Lee Pavia, with his various bands that performed at Bondi's and the Colburn Community Center. He was also the only Maltese Canadian band leader at the time, and was known mostly for playing the alto saxophone, as you can see pictured here. But he was also very skilled on the piano and the drums. Pavia's love of music was a shared passion amongst the Maltese community, who often played traditional Maltese music at social events, such as Carnival, hosted by the Maltese Canadian Club of London. Moving on now to the final group that I worked on with my research, I want to talk about Middle Eastern migrants. Many individuals from, and families from countries like Lebanon and Syria arrived in Canada due to the consequences of colonialism in their home countries. Many Middle Eastern countries were under Ottoman rule and were facing increased colonial interest from Britain, Germany, and France. This resulted in poverty and political instability in their homelands, which forced many to emigrate elsewhere. The first wave of Middle Eastern migrants to Soho arrived in the early 20th century, primarily from small towns in Lebanon, Syria, and Palestine. Many of these immigrants came to Canada as merchants and laborers. Alexander Abdallah and his wife Louisa were among the early Syrian immigrants who settled in Soho. They operated Abdullah Brothers, a fruit business at 225 Bathurst Street. The Abdallahs faced similar challenges as many other immigrants to Soho, but their business prospered due to hard work and the dedication they put into it. Middle Eastern immigrants who settled in Soho were not only laborers, but were also entrepreneurs. The Eska family was one such family who contributed significantly to the business community of Soho. Joseph Eskaft and Kamal Musulam immigrated to Soho in 1906 from Syria, and two of their grandsons would, be, would go on to make quite an impact in Soho's restaurant scene. The Eskaft brothers, Eddie and Fred, owned and operated Friar's Cellar Restaurant at the corner of Wellington and Bathurst. The restaurant was a popular spot amongst locals and employed many individuals from the neighborhood. The brothers started their restaurant in the 1940s and it grew to include the Friars II, a catering business. And the gross income of the company in, the, in 1970 would be roughly over $4 million today. Eddie Askaf was a well-known personality in the community and even had a short career in broadcasting. However, the business faced a significant challenge when it burned in 1991. Despite the set, setback, the Escaf brothers remained proud and optimistic of their business. I'll now pass the presentation on to Hannah Mantel, who will be presenting on Soho's Jewish community and Soho during the World Wars.
All right, so I'm going to be talking about the um, history of the Jewish community in Soho, which dates back to the 1850s when German Jews uh, first emigrated to London. During the 1880s and 1890s, however, there was a sudden large influx of Russian Jewish families who were fleeing state-organized massacres or pogroms. Approximately 100 of these Russian Jews settled in London as the Jewish population rose from around 50 individuals in 1881 to 144 in 1891. London's Jewish community continued to expand into the early 1900s as Jewish people in Russia and Eastern Europe continued to face persecution and violence. This forced them to immigrate to North America and Canada. In 1901, London's Jewish population consisted of 206 individuals and this increased significantly to 570 in 1911. The Wilinskis are one Jewish family who came to London in the early 1900s and have remained a prominent part of London's Jewish community for generations. The, um, Beryl and his wife, Hasa Wilinski, lived in a building on the corner of Maitland and Gray Streets. They opened a grocery store and butcher shop on the bottom floor, and the family lived upstairs. In 1907, Hasa and Beryl had a son named Hyman Wilinski, who's pictured in the first picture with um, his mother. Hyman studied at the at Western's Medical School, which was formerly in the Soho neighborhood, and he graduated in 1930, as you can see his graduation picture in the middle. Um, Dr. Hyman Walensky opened his own medical office in Soho at the corner of Maitland and Horton and treated many members of Soho's Jewish community and many other immigrant families in the neighborhood. Dr. Hyman Walensky had a daughter named after his father, Beryl Chernick, who fo followed in her father's footsteps and became a doctor and prominent figure in London's Jewish community. When Beryl and her husband, Noam Chernick, attended Western's Medical School, they lived in her father's old medical office in Soho as it was transformed into an apartment. Beryl and Noam, who are, um, their wedding picture is pictured up on the screen, um, were also largely involved in many different Jewish organizations in the community, and they remain an important part of London's Jewish community today and part of Soho's history. Next, I'm going to be talking about the role that the Soho neighborhood played during the First and Second World Wars. So during the First World War, London served as a military headquarters for those within the city and the surrounding area. Over the course of the war, over 300 people from Soho enlisted. Soho's First World War soldiers represent the diversity of the neighborhood as men and women from various ethnic communities all enlisted in the Canadian Expeditionary Force. When the First World War began in 1914, many black Canadians volunteered to serve in the Canadian Expeditionary Force, but they were unfortunately turned away as local recruiting and commanding officers believed they were unfit to serve based on racist assumptions. Black Canadians, however, continued to put pressure on their local governments and military headquarters to allow them to serve overseas. In July of 1916, the Department of Defense and Militia formed the Number 2 Construction Battalion, which served as a labor division within the war. These men were tasked with digging trenches, supplying lumber to the front, operating the water systems, and later they maintained the electrical systems. 600 black men from across Canada served with the number two construction battalion, including three men from Soho. These men were Russell Miller, Harry Alexander Morgan, and Clifford Phoenix. Although the men of the number two construction battalion never saw active combat, their contributions to the First World War were vital and never forgotten. The 18th Battalion headquarters in Windsor recruited men across southwestern Ontario. Um, they sailed for England in April of 1915, and after months of training, they saw action in France. There were four soldiers from Soho who served in the 18th Battalion, including the commander of the 18th Battalion, Henry Linton Milligan. Milligan was an accountant, and he worked at the McClary's factory before he enlisted in October of 1914. He was 43 years old at the time he enlisted, and he had 17 years of military experience under his belt. After the war, Milligan was involved in the 18th Battalion Association, which was formed shortly after the First World War. They had several events and reunions in London for members of the 18th Battalion. Members of um, the 18th Battalion Association continued to meet until the last veterans of the battalion passed away in the 1980s. For the Second World War, I'm going to be talking about um, a really interesting event that is um, remembered well um, by many Londoners. Um, so from 1944 to 1946, the Canadian Army discharged troops from service and sent them home. These men and women arrived at the train station just outside of Soho. 
They were welcomed with large crowds and celebrations. Throughout 1946, veterans continued to arrive at the train station and were welcomed by their friends and families with parades and celebrations. Uh, some of the largest celebrations took place in January of 1946 upon the arrival of London's first Hazars. Um, in February, when 800 veterans and over 2,000 civilians gathered on the streets to welcome them. And finally, in June, when some of the last uh, veterans arrived into London, um, these festivities took place in and around the train station from 1944 to 1946, and they were a significant event in London's history. It marked the end of the Second World War and all the contributions made by London civilians and soldiers during this period. Uh, now I'm gonna pass it along to Zara McDoom, who's gonna be talking about the black community. Hello, my name is Zara, and I'll be speaking about black history in Soho, followed um, by my research partner, Sarah, who will also be speaking on black history. We can only touch on a small part of what we found, but we hope to spark your curiosity to learn more about black history in London. Our aim is to show that black people live lives here. They worked, celebrated, studied, and fought injustice here. The presence of the black community in London is documented from around the 1800s to the present day. Much of the early life in London was centered in Soho. Many people arrived as freedom seekers. A freedom seeker is a person of African descent escaping the inhumane conditions of slavery via a network of safe people and places known as the Underground Railroad. This is a picture of Reverend Richard Amos Ball. Reverend Ball was a minister at Beth Emanuel British Methodist Episcopal Church in London from 1905 to 1908. Beth Emanuel Church is located at 430 Gray Street in, Lon in Soho. The congregation was historically black. In 1845, Reverend Ball was born in St. Catharines, Ontario. His father was enslaved in Virginia and came as a freedom seeker. Reverend Ball married Sophia Hussey in 1864, and together they formed the Ball Family Jubilee Singers. The Ball Family Jubilee Singers played black spirituals from the times of enslavement that were encoded to uplift, bring hope, and guide people to travel to freedom. Jubilee singers brought the spirituals to wider audiences to raise money for black churches, black education, and their members in need. The Ball family Jubilee singers toured Canada and the US in the late 1800s, and they played in places like Kingston, Winnipeg, Victoria, British Columbia. Newspapers reported um, on the sweet, cultivated, and marvelous voices of the children. In 1923, an African-Canadian newspaper, The Dawn of Tomorrow, began publication right here in London, Ontario. The paper's slogan was, devoted to the interests of the darker races. In 1924, the Ball family was on the front page of the dawn of tomorrow. And you can see that in the slide. Um, James F. Jenkins founded the paper and also founded, uh, was also a founding member of the Canadian League for the Advancement of Colored People, also known as CLAP. Fred Ball, the child in the back row of the Jubilee Singers photo, would become an active member of CLAP in the 1920s. Fred Ball is also pictured on the far right side of the photo from the newspaper. The Ball family continued to be significant in London, and Sarah will share more in her presentation. I know that there are Ball family members listening, and I thank you for the legacy of your family. And now we're going to shift ahead and um, take a look at Joey Hollingsworth. Joey Hollingsworth was born in 1936 and was raised in Soho. 
He is a singer and tap dancing great. We had the honor of conducting oral histories with Joey Hollingsworth, who now resides in Hamilton. Joey Hollingsworth was the first black man on Canadian national television. He met Bill Bojangles Robinson in 1946. He was on the Ed Sullivan Show in 1962. He performed in shows for black civil rights, and he was a long-standing long talent on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Now let's watch a short clip of Joey Hollingsworth arranged by filmmaker Linda V. Carter, and the full version can be found online. That's why I love you so much. That's why I love you like I do. do, 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 do. So I hope you enjoyed that clip. Um, I love to watch the whole thing, but I'm short on time. Um, but uh, Joey grew up at uh, 520, sorry, 527 Simcoe Street in Soho. His family grew up poor. They lived in three rooms with an Irish family of eight below. He attended Aberdeen Public School. He started tap dancing at three and a half years old, and by 12, he was tapping five to six hours a day in his house on Simcoe. Joey was surrounded by hard work, performance, and resourcefulness. Joey is a storyteller. He tells stories of his parents and grandparents. He tells another side. He tells of a warm and familiar side of his cousin, Pat, who was shot in the Ingersoll jail. He tells of playing a benefit concert for Selma, Alabama in London and the woman from the Voters League who attended. He sings songs passed on by his grandfather, Henderson. He tells of his dad working as a shoeshine boy and working in the coal yards of London. He tells of his mother as a washroom attendant at London's swanky brass rail on Dundas. He remembers gathering around the radio to listen to boxing matches with his father. His mother loved Boston cream pie and coffee. Hollingsworth put his life and rhythms into the art of dance. Hollingsworth shared the stage with people like Harry Belafonte, jazz pianist Oscar Peterson, and was directed by Oscar-nominated Norman Jewison, who directed In the Heat of the Night. When Joey left London, he left with his good friend, Tommy Hunter, and they both became stars. Joey is an inspiration, and black youngsters and families watched, them, watched him on their television sets. In 2018, Joey received the Ontario Black History Lifetime Achievement Award. His contributions are grand, and it is my hope he will gain more recognition. So to continue the stories of black history in Soho, I'm going to turn it over to my partner, uh, research partner, Sarah. Thank you. All right. So early on, black Londoners made significant contributions to baseball. These contributions began as early as 1869 with the formation of two black teams in London, the Goodwills and the Lincoln Nine. Late August that year, the Goodwills entered a tournament in London, playing against another black team called the Detroit Rialtos. This event was monumental, given that it was the first confirmed time that a black organized team played in a tournament in all of Canada's history. That same month, the Lincoln Nine played against black white teams, including the Eagle Base Baseball Club and the Wide Awakes. These teams represented the start of an extensive history of successful black teams in London. Black teams like the Goodwills and Lincoln Nine operated in a complex space, though. In the 1870s, white teams like the Guelph Maple Leafs played the Ku Klux Klan team on one day, and black teams like the St. Louis Black Sox the other. However, despite a willingness to play against black teams, there was no desire to integrate black players into their teams at that time. There's examples of this even in London, as the Tecumsehs refused to play against black teams with black players in 1878. Unfortunately, black teams in London were excluded from the written record in the years that followed. 
By the turn of the century, there was an increased inclusion of black players in the sport. At that time, black teams still could not play in the same leagues as white teams, but they could participate in exhibition games. Integration of sport did not begin until far later when Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier in 1947. An exciting development occurred in 1923 with the introduction of the Colored Stars, the first recorded black men's team since the 1860s in London. Above is an image of the team from the dawn of tomorrow, the black press paper. The Colored Stars competitively played against London and area teams and in exhibition games. In July 1923, the team played an exhibition game at Labatt Ballpark against the parents' team from the London Manufacturers League. That same year, the team achieved an impressive winning streak in August of 1923. That streak began when the Colored Stars defeated the Arcona Giants and soon after the Mitchell Giants, and that continued all the way into Labor Day when the team defeated West Lorne with a score of 3-2. The Colored Stars were also very talented performers. They played two concerts throughout the games that year, one show was even joint with the elite girls team at the Arcona game, and they had a crowd of about 500 people watching. In 1924, they also hosted a benefit concert for a hospitalized community member, George Chandler. Unfortunately, their final season was in 1924. Harry Corsi, a talented black athlete, broke barriers throughout his career, demonstrating skill and athleticism. Early in his career, he pitched for the colored, London Colored Stars, leading them to that winning streak I was speaking of. During that season, another highlight was during a game against Arcona, and he struck out 15 batters in that game. Corsi was also a talented track and field athlete, competing in the 100 meter dash. In 1924, he even qualified for the Paris Olympics. Although he chose not to compete on the advice of his trainers who recommended that he improve his style. In 1925, Corsi managed McCormick's factory team, making him the first black man to manage an Ontario Baseball Association team in history. By 1926, he made another first, becoming the first black man to play for the London Braves or the Majors. In the 30s, he was president of the popular Hotel London team and occasionally subbed in for the team as well, playing in some of their games. By June of 1933, um, the Hotel London team had won nine out of their 18 games in the season thus far. The following month, they offered another impressive performance against Bruffdale, defeating them 7-1, even with a team that was substantially injured. Hotel London also competed in an exhibition game on that same day against the Hamilton Road Merchants. And during that game, the team successfully fundraised $40 to the city's unemployed. By 1934, the team changed their name to the Harlem Aces and acquired new management. Throughout this time with Hotel London, Corsi lived in Soho at addresses on Clarence and Phillip. He went on to spend the remainder of his life in the city. In the 1920s, the elite girls baseball team pictured above consisted of young black women that played in London and area games. In July 1923, Beth Emanuel Church held its annual picnic in Port Stanley, where the team played against the London Sir Lamp Service Co. team. The elites claimed victory in that game. Sir Adam Beck, a former London mayor and a member of provincial parliament, pitched several rounds of the game and donated $2 towards the team's uniform. London Mayor George Wendage was also at this game and donated. The event was a huge success, it drew a large crowd, and they raised $15.85, which is around $266 in today's money. The following weeks, the elite girls played a snappy game against the Spark Plugs team. They continued to fundraise the team by playing concerts at Alstert Hall at the corner of Dundas and Clarence in August. Friends were encouraged to come out and support the girls. The image on the previous slide of the elite girls team was graciously shared with us by a relative of the Ball family. Using the Donna Tomorrow and other sources, we identified two players in the team photo, Helen Louise Ball and Pearl Brown. In that team photo, Helen Ball was in the front row holding baseball bats at the center. Her father was Frederick Ball. Helen's great-grandfather was Re Reverend Richard Amos Ball of the Ball Family Jubilee Singers that Zara mentioned earlier. And the image above is of her, taken from a photo with four generations of her family shortly after she gave birth to her daughter. In the photo of the elite girls, Pearl Brown is seated behind and to the left of Helen. Pearl Brown was featured in the Canadian League for the Advancement of Colored People's 1927 Convention Program, where she's listed as a secretary for the London branch. The elite girls offer a, ra a rare glance into black women's lives in the 1920s. Thank you for your time, and Mackenzie Bodner will next speak about Victoria Hospital, the War Memorial Children's Hospital, and the medical and nursing schools in Soho.
Oh, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure to share with you tonight some stories about the medical institutions that stood in the heart of Soho District, the Victoria Hospital, and the medical and nursing schools all trace their beginnings back to the 19th century London, and the War Memorial Children's Hospital opened on the heels of the First World War in 1922. Through my research, I've traced the stories of these institutions through various sources, such as newspaper articles, school yearbooks, oral interviews, and diaries of people who lived and worked in these buildings. And through those stories, themes have emerged that speak to relationships and community, innovation, and change. The relationships that existed between the medical school, the nursing school, and the hospitals were significant. Medical interns and nursing students completed hands-on practical training that helped them develop their skills and gain experience. There were also stories shared about the social relationships that existed, for instance, between young nursing students and young medical interns. I'm sure that's uh, no surprise to anybody. And stories about how some of these young students had to sneak back into their residence if their date lasted uh, past curfew. And uh, there were some interesting stories about people crawling through windows to, to get home, uh, hopefully without being caught. But it wasn't just about those relationships between the hospitals and the medical community. It was about relationships between these hospitals and the greater London community, and the stories that emerged from those relationships are really heartwarming. There were strong relationships with community, such as that of the Mocha Temple Shriners, who made sure that Santa Claus didn't forget to make a stop at the Children's War Memorial Hospital with gifts for young patients. It was about a pair of London neighbours, Karen Huckerby and Gary Jones, who, in 1974, spent over 10 hours constructing a seven-pound candy house that was ultimately devoured by 16 children who had to spend their Christmas in the hospital that year. It was about a group of women's auxiliary members who donated their time to knit finger puppets for children who were undergoing blood tests throughout the 1980s. The puppets helped alleviate patient anxiety, and in just one month, over 1,000 of these puppets were distributed with ongoing requests for more to be made. And in the wake of a 1981 theft of two giant and much beloved stuffed animals, hospital officials appealed to the public for assistance in locating Taffy the Lion and Snuffleupagus, both of which had welcomed young patients upon arrival at the admissions department. An anonymous tip led to the recovery of Snuffleupagus. I knew I was going to mess that up. <laughs> and um, despite a $25 reward, Taffy the Lion was never recovered. But moved by this news of the theft, Londoners started sending replacements to the hospital, which included a large pink panther, a giant polar bear, and several additional lions. Still, if anyone here tonight has any information on Taffy the Lion, come see me after the presentation. We'll, we'll talk. There are also firsts. And uh, these buildings and the people who lived and worked in them were there to witness these firsts. The War Memorial Children's Hospital was the first memorial hospital built in Canada. And from the admission of its very first patient, Verna Woods, in 1922, the hospital led the way in research for conditions such as leukemia, polio, diabetes, orthopedic medicine, cystic fibrosis, and neonatal care. Dr. Kathleen Braithwaite Sanborn was the first female graduate of the medical school in 1924. 
And Dr. Erwin Norbert Antone from Oneida Nation of the Thames was the first indigenous graduate of the medical school in 1976. The Children's Hospital housed the Cobalt 60 Beam Therapy Unit, simply known as the Cobalt Bomb, and it was first used in 1951 to treat cancer. These institutions also served as a marker of changing times when uniforms worn by nurses went from uh, what you're seeing here in 1887 to the other image uh, from 1960. Now, just imagine working through the Eastern North American heat wave of 1896, dressed like those women uh, in the photograph from uh, the 1800s, um, you know, swaddled in layers of fabric and laced into high heels and corsets and working without air conditioning. These were tough women. Like all of us here this evening, these people and in institutions navigated pandemics, such as the Spanish flu of 1918, and the much-feared disease of polio, which saw its most devastating outbreak in 1953. They treated outbreaks of tuberculosis with fresh air and exercise. They treated outbreaks of influenza with mustard plasters. They witnessed the progression of treatments, anesthetic, antibiotics, vaccines, medical specialization, and technological advancements. And these hospitals were often amongst the first in Canada to implement new treatments through changing times. The stories I've shared with you today are just a small representation of the remarkable legacy of these institutions and the many people who called them home, whether as patients, healthcare workers, or students. It's heartening to know that some of the very walls that once housed these institutions will now be repurposed to serve an equally vital community need, affordable housing. This project will provide a new chapter in the history of this neighborhood, ensuring that it remains a vibrant and thriving community for years to come. So on behalf of my fellow panelists, I'd like to extend thanks to everyone who attended or streamed in this evening. And I will now turn the microphone back over to Michelle. Thank you. Yes, I'd just like to uh, echo Max. Uh, thank yous to everyone here and on the live stream. And I also want to acknowledge uh, others who have helped us along the way, uh, like the Metcalf Foundation, which funds the Public History Program, uh, the Vision Soho Alliance uh, as well, uh, the London Public Library, of course, for having us, uh, and then the City of London will help us formulate the signs as we go through the, the coming year. I also want to acknowledge uh, where we got our food and drink from this evening. Uh, Stranos made the cannolis, uh, the Polish Community Hall made the apple cake, and there, uh, the European Bakery uh, on Adelaide made the custard pastries, and Starbucks uh, very graciously donated all the hot drinks to us uh, tonight. So thank you very much. So what we'd like to do now is to open up for questions. Uh, I am going to move these two microphones that you see on the floor uh, closer in, and, and you can certainly come down uh, and ask your question. Uh, we will also pause every once in a while to see if there are questions uh, on the live stream as well. And we've got microphones here that we'll pass uh, between ourselves um, to answer those questions. So just give me a moment to uh, move the microphones uh, into their position.
Okay, please, who has a question? Come on down. So we do ask you to come down to the microphone because we are live streaming. So for those who are uh, live, uh, they won't be able to hear your question if you, if you don't come down to the microphone. Hi, Kaylee, how are you? Hi, guys. Um, so my question is for Zara and Sarah, I believe. Um, I wondered if you had a favorite story from Joey, because I know you interviewed him quite extensively. Um, so if you have a favorite story from that interview, I'd love to hear about it. Not sure if this is a little closer. Okay, um, yeah, we we actually uh, Joey Hollingsworth uh, was gracious enough to grant us uh, three oral interviews, and uh, we we are also continuing to do more with him. And it's so hard to choose a particular story. Um, he's a great storyteller, and stories usually last like ten or fifteen minutes, and so it's really hard to sum something up for a minute. Um, and do we have a favorite? Um, I, I'm, I'm captivated by the story of his, uh, his cousin, uh, Pat Kelly from Ingersoll. And so he was, um, and I, I have to research the background or the details, but uh, he was a bank robber, and, uh, and he, um, but he was also known to Joey and Joey's mother and the family. And uh, so Joey will tell the side of his dimples and, and the big hugs that he came, that he gave and, and how he sat uh, in his father's chair when they came to visit in the three rooms of the house. And Joey just had a, a kitchen, a living room and a bedroom um, in his home. And, uh, and after he robbed the bank, he brought the, the bank load of uh, the, the bag of money over to Joey's house uh, to give it to his mother. Um, and because he appreciated his mother and what his mother had done for him. And eventually, after uh, spending some time and, and having an interesting life, uh, some years later, he was arrested again in the Ingersoll jail. And um, he was a, a, a good escape artist and uh, tried to escape and was shot and, um, and later died um, from, that, from that incident. But uh, Joey remembers him in a very lovely way and uh, it's nice to have a, a, another perspective. Um, so that's, that's one story. Thank you. Hey there. Lost steps, lost steps. <laughs> hey, I, this, this question is open to anyone. Um, I remember watching Tommy Hunter on uh, back in the 70s, when you guys were talking about the tap dancing and that. And I was wondering, what from this can we apply to today to make our quality of life better, no matter if you're rich, poor, working, not working? What do you guys think? Can we use any of this to make our impact our lives on a personal level? That's a wonderful question, thank you. And what I would say is community involvement. Um, while my research was primarily focused on the medical institutions, what really came through was how important they were to the community and how many different ways community got involved from individuals to public schools, high schools, um, charity groups and organizations. I think that if we saw that level of community involvement uh, devoted to projects that are going on within London and people who require help, uh, we, would, we would see so much wonderful work accomplished. So that would be the lesson I took away from this research is the sheer importance of community involvement. Thank you. So I just have a, an addition to that. Um, so one of the reasons uh, why the Alliance asked us to do this research, one of the ultimate goals is that the future tenants to the um, seven apartment buildings uh, will be able to see uh, the history of the site, 
uh, and get a sense of the, the history of the site in order to invest in, their, in the place, right? So to see that their history uh, reflected back at them in the signs, uh, and then you know have a greater investment in in the in their in their new home essentially. So using history for um, uh, making a sense of place. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Uh, I, I won the race down there. <laughs> All yours. Uh, I'm so competitive. Uh, so thank you. Thank you so much for doing this. This is, uh, I moved into Soho five years ago. I live on South Street. And uh, so I got a couple of things on my mind. One is that I'm an immigrant from Northern Ireland. And I had no idea I was moving into the immigrant part of London. And I feel so excited tonight to know that, and that there were Irish people down the street. Uh, who knows? Some of my relatives, maybe. I live right across from the Richard B. Hansen Park, but I didn't hear you talking about Richard B. A anything I should know about him? Yeah, I, I think you're talking about the Richard Barry Harrison part. That's what I'm talking yeah. about. And uh, so, yes, he, he was, he's a uh, part of the story of the black Londoners here in, in London. And his parents arrived, both of them, as uh, freedom seekers. And Richard Barry Harrison um, went to Waterloo Street Public School. Um, he sold the London Advertiser on uh, street corners. Um, his mother was known as she, as she came um, as, a, as a freedom seeker. She brought the traditions um, from where she came. So she was known for her biscuits um, in the local, in their hot biscuits in the local uh, neighborhood. Richard Barry Harrison um, went on to become a, uh, to become a, a theater performer. And uh, he's known for his ability to recite Shakespeare. And he was well known in his play Green Pastures, um, which played in 1934 on Broadway. It was a Pulitzer, Pulitzer Prize winning play. Um, and uh, he, he came, I think it was with six train cars of, uh, that loaded on with, with all of uh, uh, the scenery and the cast of the play. And they came here to London, Ontario, and they performed in the Grand Theatre in 1934. Um, he was welcomed at Beth Emanuel Church um, on Gray Street, and um, many local um, uh, black uh, um, significant figures were there. So you heard about Fred Ball. Fred Ball was there. Um, we mentioned uh, Paul Lewis, who uh, worked um, in, in London as, uh, as a porter at a uh, barber shop on Dundas. Paul Lewis sang songs. There was a lot of tears and emotion. And, um, and he always remembered London. He always remembered Soho. And he said that the people that he met here um, helped him to uh, play his character, which was the Lord in, uh, in Green Pastures. So yeah, he's a wonderful figure. <laughs> so thank you for that question. Thank I you. appreciate thank it. Thank you. Please, Catherine. Well, congratulations to you all for a wonderful job in unearthing all these fascinating stories. I'm interested in whether all of that diversity is still in existence today in Soho, all of the uh, different communities that you identified, and I'm sure there are many more, but could you comment on that? I'll come on on that. Uh, so uh, there's, I would say, less diversity at this point. Um, so some of the communities moved away, although some of their, what I would call, build heritage or community center points are still there. Uh, so for instance, um, when we were talking with uh, some of the Polish uh, descendants uh, last year, they told us they largely don't live in, uh, in Soho anymore, but they still have their church there, uh, language school, and they also have their hall there, which is sort of their community center, that's where they get married and so on. And so they still have uh, a place for Soho in their lives, but they don't necessarily live there, so that is a bit different. Um, in talking with the Italian community, they said the same thing. They kind of moved a little bit further down uh, Hamilton Road to sort of the sort of Hamilton Highbury area. 
um, and, uh, and and then their their church, which is uh, what Nigel talked about um, at uh, Lyle. Uh, street there is sort of their community point, it's just slightly outside of Soho. But Beth Manuel Church is still there on, on Gray Street, and that's the center of a black community quite a bit. So uh, I guess the answer is yes and no, but um, the touch points are still there, but the, the people aren't still necessarily living there. So, but things are starting to come back. Uh, there's the new Indigenous Child Care Center, for instance, that's been built. So you touched on the fact that this, it was very much a center for new immigrants. Is that still the case today? Um, I don't know the answer to that. Julie, do you know the answer to that? Oh, me? Yes. Um, no, I, I don't know either. I don't know either. Okay. It's still a, an affordable area of the city. But, yeah. Okay. Thanks very much. Thanks, Catherine. Oh, I'm Hi sorry. there. My name's Joellen, and I'm a realtor with Royal LePage. We work downtown in the Soho area. And I have a passion for old houses. Um, I'm really thrilled that you came tonight, and I want to thank you for delivering uh, so much history. Uh, one of the things that I struggle with when, when showing that neighborhood is, is uh, no walk to grocery stores. So while it's still very beautiful and I love the old houses, it's a tough sell. And I'm wondering how that will be addressed. Or was there grocery stores in the neighborhood at one time or another? So there were grocery stores. It's one of the, the things that we've noticed over time is um, uh, a lot of the facilities um, have sort of left Soho as the population left Soho. So uh, the Victoria, what, what's now a, a tacos place, uh, used to be a more commonly known as Victoria Tavern, but originally that was a Jewish grocery store. Um, there was also uh, mentioned in a lot of our oral histories called, uh, there was a place called Lapovich's Meat Market, which was another Jewish store that a lot of people uh, would, um, would uh, go to shop. And I believe that was on South Street near the hospital. Um, so yes, there were absolutely things there that we identify with um, uh, making communities viable and, and grocery stores, pharmacies, coffee shops, things like that. Um, a lot of them have left, uh, and you see a lot of empty spaces sort of in Soho as you drive down the streets. And some of those used to be factories that have been demolished. Some of them used to be homes. Some of them used to be other things like stores. Um, but I'll turn to Julie for about the, 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 the contemporary grocery store issue. Yeah, it's, it's definitely something that we've We've heard from the neighborhood and, and have seen ourselves that you know the closest grocery store is really at Commissioners in Wellington, um, and so um, while we're not grocery store developers, we are hopeful that the approximately thousand people that will move in uh, to our development, as well as the Medallion development, which is planned to be two towers of I think 300 units each or something, um, will bring. Um, maybe more uh, enough uh, people that, that it makes a, a grocery store viable. Um, the other thing that we're doing is, um, you may have heard that the um, London Food Bank has offered the development, um, the, the, the allowing, alliance a um, million dollars to um, develop food security programming within, um, within that, that space. And um, while, while it will primarily um, benefit the people that are living in the affordable housing units, um, we hope that there's some spillover, um, possibly uh, a market that would happen um, in that auditorium space that I showed you or in the public park um, out front. So um, we're hopeful that there will be um, opportunities to, to grow food security for the whole neighborhood um, with programming and food, good food boxes and maybe even some markets. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi. Thank you so much. This has been really fascinating. I just have two quick questions. As you mentioned, the SOHO label and the land acknowledgement is pretty new. I have a pretty good idea of why it's called SOHO, being south of Horton. Um, but when did this term come about? And how strongly would many of these communities and individuals identify with the term SOHO, especially at the turn of the century? Would they be using SOHO? Um, thank you. Uh, I don't know exactly when the term uh, started. Uh, as I said earlier, it would, would be considered um, or called St. David's Ward originally. Uh, and then the ward system went over to numbers. Um, so, um, depending on what time period we're talking about, uh, wards one, three, and five covered Soho, except for they also went to, I can't remember if it's King or Dundas, so they also extended 
uh, further north, so you couldn't say just this number was in uh, was in Soho. Um, so uh, I think you know the things that would have bounded their neighborhood is the river, obviously, uh, the railway. Um, I'm not sure if Adelaide would have been identified as a um, you know a, a point for them. Uh, Julie, do you know when Soho became a label? I, I feel like the audience would, might oh. know that. It's about what it was. It was actually me. Oh, right. oh. it was actually me. Um, I bought a house at the turn of the century. Pardon me. No, no, it actually came from me, and I knew Judy. Oh, okay. And I've been talk I've been talk talking about it for a long time. And um, I moved into the neighborhood at the turn of the century, um, which 20 years ago people went turn of which century. Um, and I started calling it Soho for South of Horton, and I, I said it gave the neighborhood a certain cachet it didn't actually possess at that point. Um, and then a couple of years after I moved in, we, we built the community association, and there was, there was talk about what to call the neighborhood, um, and it was St. David's Ward, and that would be the neighborhood name that people would be familiar with. Um, yes, yeah, Soho was just, just a more, far more recent creation. Uh, yeah, thank you, and thank you to the audience. <laughs> okay, Stella got stage fright. Stella okay. is wondering if Bondi's is still owned by the same family, and is it good? <laughs> That, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, it is not, no longer owned by the same family. It was uh, sold off and Vincent Bondi um, unfortunately passed away last year. Um, but th the family is still very sentimental over the business and it doesn't exist in the same spot. It's not in Soho anymore. It's, um, I forget which street it's on now. It's North, it's Springbank. Yeah, it's on Springbank, yeah. <laughs> right there. Um, and I've heard it's great, so. <laughs> Please go get some pizza after this. Enjoy yourself. Definitely good pizza. Any further questions? Okay. Well, seeing none, I want to thank you again, uh, everybody, for coming. Uh, please stay around, and if you have other uh, questions that are popping into your mind, please ask uh, my graduate students or Julie or myself. Uh, and stay around and hang out and chat as well. Uh, so, and thank you uh, very much uh, all for coming on this Tuesday night. So thank you very much. Sorry, Monday night. <laughs> <laughs>